This lecture contains one of the central results of this course. If you have listened to the last lecture, it should not be very difficult for you to guess what that is. After all, a theorem which has been described as wonderful, magnificent or just plain great has to be one of the central results of this course and that is exactly what we are going to talk about in this particular lecture. I am referring of course to the great orthogonality theorem. Well, for the Game of Thrones fans out there, this also is GOT. But as far as this particular course is concerned, this is actually much more thrilling than the struggle for the Iron Throne is ever going to be. So, this is what we are going to talk about today, the Great Orthogonality Theorem. But as you must remember from my last lecture, the two lemmas that I had introduced there, Schur's lemmas, are the ones that are going to be essential in proving the theorem. So let me first start by recapitulating these very important lemmas. As you should be able to recall from the last lecture, Schur's lemmas are actually two lemmas. They are both central tools used in the discussion of irreducibility or reducibility of group representations. And lemma 1 has as a setting two vector spaces V1 and V2 and you have two irreducible set of operators Ti1 and Ti2 where i runs from 1, 2 all the way up to n for both sets and in addition you have an operator x which maps V1 to V2 and which obeys x Ti1 equals Ti2 x. That is, x intertwines between these two irreducible set of operators. Then, what lemma 1 says is, x must either be the null map or it must be invertible. Nothing in between is allowed. For lemma 2, the setting is a single vector space V on which you have an irreducible set of operators T1, T2 up to Tn. And here you have a map x which maps v to itself and it commutes with each and every one of the ti's. So x ti equals ti x where i runs from 1, 2 all the way up to n. Then as lemma 2 says, x must be a multiple of the identity operator. Since the term irreducible set of operators has been used over and over again in the statement of both the lemmas. Let me just quickly remind you what an irreducible set of operators is. It's a set of operators such that the only subspace of the vector space V, which is invariant under the action of all of them, are the trivial subspace with only the null vector or the linear space V itself. Let me remind you, that the reason why these lemmas are important in group representation theory is that the operators which represent the group elements for an irreducible representation of the group form an irreducible set of operators on the underlying vector space. So the results that we have here for an arbitrary irreducible set of operators can be translated directly to the operators which represent group elements if you have an irreducible representation. And while we have stated these lemmas in the language of linear algebra, you can easily translate these to the language of matrices simply by choosing a basis on the underlying vector space or spaces as the case may be and using the standard connection between linear operators on one hand and matrices on the other. And in what comes next, we are going to use the fact that these lemmas work just as well for the set of matrices which stand in for group elements in the case of an irreducible matrix representation. And as we will soon see, through a not too involved argument, but not a very trivial one either, this is going to lead us to the Great Orthogonality Theorem. To set the stage for the Great Orthogonality Theorem, we consider two irreducible matrix representations of a group. 
and these matrix representations are labeled by two labels alpha and beta so we have d alpha and d beta and what is important is that if alpha is the same as beta then these two representations are identical however if alpha is not equal to beta they are not only not identical they are actually inequivalent now let me remind you that equivalent representations are essentially the same representation just looked at using a different basis on the underlying vector space so frankly we do not really consider equivalent representations as different representations and that is exactly what we mean when we choose this setting that we have two irreps which are either identical or inequivalent so imagine that what we are trying to do here is create a list of all the irreps a particular group has and as you will soon see maybe not in this lecture but perhaps in the next one that the number of irreps of a finite group is definitely finite we are listing all of them however when i said that the number of irreps is finite you must realize that i am only talking about inequivalent irreps because given a particular irrep any representation which is equivalent to it that is one which you can obtain from the first irrep by doing a similarity transformation is also going to be an irrep and of course there are infinitely many such similar representations so what we have done here when we are compiling this hypothetical list of ours is that we have included every irreducible representation only once up to equivalences which means that if a particular representation has been counted in this list then any other representation which is equivalent to it has not been listed so we have put this label alpha or beta or gamma on top of these representations and what they do is that they tell us that if alpha is equal to beta then you are talking about the same representation if alpha is not equal to beta then you are talking about two representations which are not only irreducible they are in equivalent let small d alpha and small d beta denote the dimensions of the two representations respectively that means capital d alpha maps every group element small g from the group capital g to a d alpha by d alpha matrix and d beta maps every group element small g to a small d beta by small d beta matrix now we will consider a special combination of these matrices of the following form this matrix x is a small d alpha by small d beta matrix and in defining this what we have used is an arbitrary matrix z which has just the correct dimensions for this sum on the right hand side of the definition to make sense well the sum will come later the size for the matrix z that is d alpha by d beta is necessary for each one of the summands to make sense and the summands are d alpha g z d beta g inverse so one term for every group element and you sum up over the entire group let me remind you we had already seen this trick of summing over the entire group earlier when we tried to prove that for a finite group every representation has an equivalent unitary representation and if you recall the basic idea in this proof was whether you sum over a group element small g or you sum up over a group element small g g prime where g may be fixed but g prime runs over the entire group you end up with the same sum because as g prime runs over the entire group g g prime also runs over the entire group in what follows we are going to exploit this particular property of the sum by multiplying this quantity x on the left by d alpha small g and on the right by d beta small g inverse where small g is a particular fixed element from capital g of course when i do that i need to change the summation index so to speak 
which was g in x the original definition to g prime after all this is a dummy index which just says that you have to add up over all elements of the group so this is what we end up with now we can easily move in the d alpha g on the left and d beta g inverse on the right inside the sum and that gives us d alpha g d alpha g prime on the left of z d beta g prime inverse d beta g inverse on the right of z now using the fact that d alpha and d beta are both matrix representations and hence obey the basic group properties d alpha g d alpha g prime is d alpha g g prime and d beta g prime inverse d beta g inverse is d beta of g prime inverse g inverse we now still have one more step to take which is use of fact that g prime inverse g inverse is of course g g prime's inverse and so now notice that the sum on the right is exactly of the same form as the sum in x except that instead of the group element small g which you had in the original expression now you have the group element small g g prime and the sum is over g prime but as i have said when g prime runs over the entire group g g prime also runs over the entire group in some other order that exactly is a rearrangement theorem thus the sum on the right of the expression here is exactly the same as the one in x and so this is equal to x hence we end up with the result that d alpha g x d beta g inverse is the same as x so this small d alpha by small d beta matrix x has this particular property that d alpha g x is x times d beta g that is x intertwines between the set of matrices d alpha and d beta and it does so for each and every small g belonging to capital g the set d alpha g and the set d beta g form an irreducible set of operators or rather form the matrix representation of an irreducible set of operators hence according to schurz-weiss lemma the matrix x must be either the null matrix or it must be an invertible matrix now according to our convention if alpha and beta are different the representations d alpha and d beta are inequivalent hence in this case for alpha and beta being different the inverse of x cannot exist because if it did it would contradict our demand that alpha and beta being different implies d alpha and d beta are inequivalent what about if alpha were equal to beta for alpha equal to beta x must be a multiple of the identity matrix that's your second lemma and now our job essentially is to figure out exactly what multiple this is first let us combine the two statements if alpha and beta are different then x must vanish if alpha and beta are equal then x must be a multiple of the identity combining the two together we end up with the statement that x which of course is sum over all g belonging to capital g d alpha g z d beta g inverse for some small d alpha by small d beta matrix z this must be equal to delta alpha beta which makes the thing vanish when alpha is not equal to beta times the identity matrix times c some constant which depends of course on your choice of the matrix z now you must be wondering at this stage what should the dimensionality of this identity matrix be should it be a small d alpha dimensional one or a small d beta dimensional one a bit of thought will tell you that that is really not an issue here since the right hand side vanishes if alpha is not equal to beta i don't really care which identity you are putting in on the right if alpha is not equal to beta so the only situation that you are really worried about the identity matrix is when alpha equals beta and then of course whether you call it d alpha or small d beta dimensional matrix does not matter because small d alpha and small d beta are both the same in that case so our task that is left now is calculating the value of this constant c which of course as i've said depends on which matrix z you have chosen
Remember, at this stage, the capital Z matrix can be completely arbitrary. The fact that capital X intertwines between the two representations will work no matter what Z you choose. And that actually is what gives the resulting theorem, the great orthogonality theorem, its immense power. Of course, to find C, what we really need to do is put alpha equals beta because that's the only time when C really appears on the right hand side. So what we get is when the two representations are identical, then d alpha g z d alpha g inverse is equal to C times identity where the identity is a small d alpha by small d alpha d identity. The next step would be to take the trace of both sides. Now, if you take the trace of the right hand side, you'd obviously end up with capital C, the constant, times small d alpha, the dimensionality of the identity matrix. What about the left hand side? The left hand side, of course, is a sum of traces of lots of matrices. But each and every one of these matrices are similar to the matrix Z. And similar matrices all have the same trace. So each and every term on the left hand side actually gives you trace of z. Remember now that we are dealing with alpha equals beta, z is actually a square matrix. So its trace is perfectly well defined. And since each term gives you trace of z, the left hand side sum is actually trace of z into the order of the group capital G, the number of terms which this sum has. And this is what you end up with. Order of G times trace of Z must be equal to C times the dimensionality of the representation you're talking about. So this gives us C mod G trace Z by D alpha. And putting all this together in the expression, what we end up with is this. The sum over all small g, all elements of the group of D alpha small g Z D beta G inverse, where Z is some arbitrary small d alpha by small d beta matrix must be equal to delta alpha beta and this ensures that you only talk about the rest of the factors when alpha equals beta times mod g by d alpha trace z times the identity the d alpha dimensional identity and this is going to be our starting point from which we can write down several expressions we can call this the great orthogonality theorem or we usually call one of its consequences or one of the results equivalent to it, the great orthogonality theorem. But this is basically what the hullabaloo is all about. This is the central result that we were focusing on. The equivalent version I refer to right now follows from the matrix relation above simply by taking the ijth element of both sides. So if I take the small ijth element of the left hand side, what I get is d alpha ik of g times zkl times d beta lj of g inverse summed over all k running from 1 to d alpha and all l running from 1 to d beta and then of course finally summed over the entire group capital G. That's what you have on the left. On the right you have the constants times the ijth element of the identity. Hence you get mod g by d alpha trace z delta alpha beta delta ij. So this is our relation in component language. Now, notice that this really is not one relation because you are completely free to choose the ZKLs. That is, the ZKLs are completely arbitrary. So this really is not one relation. This is actually D alpha times D beta distinct relations. And to make those relations clearer, let us choose a special form of the matrix Z. We choose ZKL to be equal to delta KI prime, delta LJ prime. And what this means is that this matrix Z that I've chosen is actually full of zeros with only a single entry, which is one, which is the I prime -th row, J prime -th column element. All other en entries in this matrix is zero. If you think about it a bit, all we have done is we have written down our arbitrary Z in terms of a basis of the space of all such rectangular matrices. That is, any Z can be written down as a linear combination of the special kind of Zs that we are talking about here, 
So the consequence of the relationship that we have written down for any arbitrary z can be broken down into special results for this particular z. Now, for this particular choice of zkl, the trace is very easy to figure out. Remember, this has only a single one in the i prime th row j prime th column. All other elements are zero. So this single one will be on the diagonal and contribute to the trace only if i prime equals j prime. So the trace will be zero if i prime is not equal to j prime and one if i prime is equal to j prime. That is, trace of z is simply delta i prime j prime. So by substituting this particular choice of zkl and using the simple properties of the delta symbol to sum up over k and l trivially, and using trace that is delta i prime j prime, what you end up with is this result. What you have here is in the sum over k, the delta k i prime has forced the d, d alpha i k to become d alpha i i prime. Similarly, d beta j l j has become d beta j prime j, g inverse. So we end up with this final result. Sum over small g belonging to capital G, d alpha g of i i prime d beta g inverse of j prime j must be equal to mod g by d alpha times a bunch of delta symbols delta alpha beta delta i j delta i prime j prime. Note that in this relationship each and every one of the indices i i prime j prime and j are free indices there is no sum over any of these indices which means that what you really have is a huge number of relations. I can take d alpha values, so can I prime. J prime and j each can take d beta values. So the number of equations that you have written here is actually d alpha square times d beta square. So quite a huge number of relations re rolled up in this one expression. No wonder this theorem is called great. This actually is the great orthogonality theorem. The orthogonality, that you, as you can easily see, is basically coming from the fact that whenever alpha and beta are different, whenever i and j are different, whenever i prime and j prime are different, you end up with a sum which is zero. The connection between the usual notion of orthogonality that we have, that of an inner product vanishing, becomes reasonably clear the moment you look at the left hand expression, is really a sum over an index set. Here the indexing is done by all group elements. And that is very similar to the way in which we write down inner products, where we take ai multiplied by bi and sum up. This is a very similar thing, where instead of i, that is instead of an index labeling a vector component, what we are using is g, the group element over which this sum is running. In fact, the connection becomes even more stark if we consider an unitary representation. In an unitary representation, d beta g inverse is of course d beta g is adjoint. So the j prime j element of d beta g inverse is nothing but the j j prime element of d beta g conjugated. So what you end up with is this result that if you multiply the i i prime element of d alpha g with the j j prime element of d beta g's conjugate and then sum over all g, you end up with something which vanishes whenever alpha and beta are not the same. Also, whenever i and j are not the same, whenever i prime and j prime are not the same and so on. This is very similar to the way in which you do dot product or complex vectors. In case you have gotten a bit lost in the maze of indices here, let me point out that here the vector index, the component index is really small g. So small g labels each and sep every separate component. And what we really have is not one pair of vectors whose orthogonality we are talking about. Each value of i, i prime, j and j prime gives you a separate vector. And we are talking of orthogonality of all these vectors put together. At this point, it may be a good idea to pause a while and take a look at a concrete example. And for a concrete example, what can we turn to except our old friend, the group S3, the set of symmetries of an equilateral triangles. 
We have already seen several representations of this group in previous lectures. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out three of them which happen to be irreducible. Now, these are the three representations that I'm talking about. The representation number, number one, the one on the top row, is a one-dimensional representation. So is representation number two. Representation number three happens to be a two-dimensional representation. In fact, it happens to be the two-dimensional representation of the group S3 that we had figured out in a previous lecture. Now, the fact that representation number one is a representation, first of all, is something which is trivial because every group has this one representation where every element maps onto the number one. Now, that this representation is irreducible is also trivial. After all, this is one dimensional and there is no space for it to go down any further. So, a one dimensional representation has to be irreducible by definition. Of course, that also applies for representation number two. And in case you are wondering where that came from, there are several ways in which you could understand its origin. One of them would simply be to realize that the group S3 has three elements which are reflections, namely E, D and F, and three which are rotations. And all we have done is ascribe plus one to rotations and minus one to reflections. And this actually is perfectly consistent with the standard rule that a reflection followed by a reflection is a rotation, a rotation followed by a reflection is a reflection, and so on. Of course, there's another way in which you could have arrived at this particular representation. One standard way of getting a one-dimensional representation for any group is start with a matrix representation and then take the determinant of each and every one of the matrices. In fact, if you did that to representation number three, the two-dimensional representation that you can see on your screen, you are going to get 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1 and 1 in that order. And just one pedantic point, the top rows, top two rows, are really filled up with matrices, 1 by 1 matrices. Because we are good faces, we will not distinguish between 1 by 1 matrices and numbers and we are just going to write them as simple numbers. Before we go any further, let me point out that while we are convinced that rows number 1 and 2 do stand for irreducible representations, are we so sure that the representation shown in row 3 is irreducible? We will describe methods by which, given a representation, you can easily figure out algorithmically whether it is reducible or not. However, at this stage, we have not derived such a relation as yet. So you have two choices. Either you can accept the fact that this is an irreducible representation because I say so, which of course is always a bad idea, or you can actually argue that this is irreducible without making use of any fancy algorithm that we are going to talk about later. And the way to do that is simply understand the geometry of what it means when you say a representation is reducible. Remember, this is a two-dimensional representation on the plane. Now, if this representation were reducible, that would mean that there would be a lower dimensional invariant subspace, which is non-trivial. Now, since this is dimension 2, the only non-trivial lower dimensional subspace possible is dimension 1, that is, a ray or a line, multiples of a single vector. Now, can there be a ray which is invariant under each and every one of these operations. It is easy to see that there is a one-dimensional subspace which is invariant under any reflection. The particular one-dimensional subspace which is invariant under A is along the median about which the reflection A occurs. So, if you were to look at the subgroup consisting of only E and A, one of the medians of the triangle is going to be invariant under the action of both E and A. However, we are not looking for a subspace which is invariant under the action of a subset of the operation. We are looking for a subspace which is invariant under all the operations. Now, it is easy to see that B 
which is a reflection along some other median, will not leave the previous line invariant. The only thing which will remain invariant under both A and B is simply the only thing which is common to the two medians, which is nothing but the center of the triangle. Well, in fact, I didn't even have to argue it out this far. I could have just taken a look at the rotation D. And since every line in the plane will rotate around when you rotate through 120 degrees, it's obvious that there is no invariant one-dimensional subspace as far as the rotation D is concerned. So, the only subspace of my two-dimensional vector space which can be invariant under all the six operations is either just a point, the null vector, which is just the origin or the center of the triangle, or the entire 2D subspace itself. So, from just the geometry of the problem, we can be sure that this particular representation, the representation which I have, la which I have labeled number 3 in the table above, is also an irreducible representation. One last thing. Let me point out that each of the representations here are actually unitary representations so that we are justified in using the unitary form for the great orthogonality theorem. The fact that the first two representations are both unitary is very, very easy to check. The fact that the last representation in the list, the two-dimensional one, is also unitary or since it's real, it's actually orthogonal, is pretty easy to check. Frankly, given the fact that these are rotations and reflections we are talking about, it should be pretty obvious that the corresponding matrices should be orthogonal and hence they are real orthogonal, hence they are actually unitary. Let us now see what the orthogonality theorem tells us about these irreducible representations. As I have said before, the orthogonality theorem is not one result. It's many, many results rolled into one. In fact, your choice of alpha, your choice of beta, the two representations that you're talking about, you can choose your i, i prime, j, j prime indices. And for each of the choices, you get one relation out of this equation. So let's illustrate a few examples of that. We will start by choosing alpha and beta, both to be representation number one. And of course, because this representation is one dimensional, in this case, you don't really have any choice about i, i prime, j and j prime. They all have to be 1 because that's the only possible value that i, i prime, j and j prime can take here. So basically, you're using the orthogonality relation on these elements which are illustrated in red here. And what this relation now says is that if you multiplied each such number by itself, and added the result together, what you are going to get is mod g, which is 6, divided by the dimension of the representation, which is 1. All the delta alpha, beta, delta ij, delta i prime, j prime factors here will of course be 1. So you expect to get 6, which of course is a trivial result, because what you are getting is 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1, 6 times, when added together gives you 6. So to see a slightly less trivial result, let's make a different choice. Let's now choose our first representation, the one with alpha as the representation number one, and let's choose for beta representation number two. Again, because both of these representations are one dimensional, the only possible choices you have for i, i prime, j, j prime is one. They all have to take the value one, and now what you are saying is you have to multiply the elements of the top row, the ones marked in red here, by the elements in the lower row, which are also marked in red, and add together. And if you do that, it's easy to see that you get three products which are plus one for E, D, and F, and three products which are minus one for A, B, and C. And when you add them together, you of course get zero. And note that you are bound to get zero because of the delta alpha beta on the right hand side of the orthogonality theorem. These two representations are orthogonal to each other in that sense. Because you are using two different representations, you are going to get a zero. And that's exactly verified here. Let us now go in for a slightly more non-trivial example. 
Here we are going to take two representations. The trivial one, our representation number one for alpha and for beta I will take representation number three, the two dimensional one. For alpha, the values i and i prime can only run from 1 to d alpha, which is 1 to 1. So here you have no choice. But now you can choose different pairs, in fact, four different pairs for j and j prime. For the time being, I am choosing j and j prime also to be 1. That means I am really looking at the 1 1 element of each of the six matrices, which are all indicated in red now on the table above. So what we need to do is multiply the elements marked in red, the ones from the representation number 1, that's d alpha i i prime, and one from the representation number 3, which is d beta j j prime, and add the products together. So of course if you do that, the result that you are going to get is slightly more complicated than in the previous example. But it's pretty straightforward, ultimately, to see that the result is going to give you zero. And once again, it's the orthogonality between different alpha values, or alpha and beta values, which actually gives you the zero. So to continue with the two-dimensional example, let's choose both alpha and beta to be our representation number three, the two-dimensional representation. Now, of course, I have several choices for i, i prime, j, and j prime. In fact, each of them can take values of 1 or 2. So, there are 16 possible choices here. I have just uh, chosen, once again, to take i and i prime as well as j and j prime all equal to 1. That is, I am talking of the 1-1 one, one element of the matrix. And when I write down the orthogonality relation, d alpha i, i prime times d beta j, j prime conjugation, I am going to multiply each element by itself and add together. So, of course, that means 1 square plus minus 1 whole square plus half square plus half square plus minus half square plus minus half whole square. And the sum total of all of this pretty easily can be seen to be 3. Why is this 3? Note that the right hand side says mod g 6 by d, d alpha, d alpha being the dimensionality of the representation. So, 6 by 2 is 3. Of course, the 3 delta symbols here are all equal to 1. So, even in this case, the orthogonality theorem is verified. Now, I can keep on giving example after example, but let me just end with one more non-trivial example. Again, with alpha and beta both taken from representation number 3, the two-dimensional one, and here what I have done is I have taken i and i prime to be both 1. So I have taken the 1, 1 element for the first factor. And I have taken j to be 1, j prime to be 2. That means I am talking of the 1, 2 element for the second factor. And now, if you just multiply the two things which you see in red on the screen above and add them together, that is 1 times 0 plus minus 1 times 0 plus half times root 3 by 2 and so on. It, you should be easily able to check that the answer is 0 as your orthogonality theorem will tell you. Remember, the orthogonality is a result which works not only for alpha and beta, that is, alpha and beta being different will make it vanish. It also works for i and j and i prime and j prime. What you end up with is because you have chosen j and j prime to be different, you end up because you have chosen i prime and j prime to be different, in other words, you are not taking the same element twice for the matrices, you are going to end up with a zero. I hope this concrete example has made the idea behind the rather compact theorem that we have a bit clearer. As you can see, this really illustrates that even in such a simple case, a small group with only three irreducible representations as listed here and rather small irreps at that, it's still a lot of information. It is this immense amount of information that it contains that gives the great orthogonality theorem its great power. However, for many uses, 
This happens to be too much information. You may not need all of it all the time. So let me now present to you a watered down version, in a sense, of these orthogonality relations, which will turn out to be very, very useful. I'm referring to the orthogonality relation between character vectors, a concept that I'm going to introduce next. But before I do that, let me assure you that there are indeed applications where the full power of the great orthogonality theorem is actually needed. So it's not as if the character vector orthogonality relations will be able to tell us all that we ever need in group theory. However, as you will see in this and subsequent lectures, quite a lot of information can be obtained simply from the latter, which is what I'm going to present to you now. To proceed, we start with the great orthogonality theorem as written for unitary representations. We will come back to this point about unitary representations soon, but for the time being, let us start with that. What we do next is we set i equals i prime. So instead of choosing all values of i and i prime independently, we only choose to consider those cases where i prime and i are equal and also j prime and j are equal. And not only that, we then sum over all possible values of i and all possible values of j. That means that I am actually going to sum over i d alpha i i of g with i running from 1 to d alpha. This of course gives me nothing but the trace of the matrix d alpha g. Similarly, we get the, the sum over j of d beta j j g becomes the trace of d beta g. In the sum, you end up with the conjugate of that. So on the left hand side, what we get is the sum over all group elements of chi alpha g, chi beta g star, where chi is simply a map which maps every element small g of the group to the trace of the corresponding matrix D of G. This map, of course, assigns to every group element a particular number depending on which representation you're talking about. By the way, we have been talking about irreducible representations only so far, but the character map can also be defined perfectly well for any representation. Any representation will assign a matrix to a group element. And what we are doing here is we are assigning to every group element the trace of this corresponding matrix. Now, what about the right hand side? On the right hand side, I put i equal to j and i prime equal to j prime. I put i equal to i prime and j equal to j prime. And this essentially ends up giving me delta i j delta i j and by the property of the delta symbol the square of the delta i j symbol is simply delta i j again and i'm now going to add it up over all values of j and all values of i it is pretty easy to show that what you are going to get as a result only if alpha equals beta but that's the only case where the right hand side is non-zero the result is going to be d alpha and hence what you end up with is this relation. On the left hand side, you get the sum over every group element, small g of capital G, of chi alpha g, chi beta g star, and this has to be equal to mod g delta alpha beta. The d alphas cancel from the sum. And of course, as I've said, chi g is a trace of d of g. So for every given, for any given representation, the character of a group element is nothing but the trace of the matrix corresponding to that particular group element. Note that expressed in this form, the connection between this orthogonality relation and that of the standard orthogonality between vectors that we have always learned and known about becomes very clear. Uh, chi alpha g, chi beta g star is being summed over all values of small g. So, if we think of putting the numbers chi alpha g1, chi alpha g2, chi alpha g3 
all numbers for each and every group element in order in a column vector what we are going to get is a column vector whose size whose number of elements of course is the order of the group and we will get one such column vector for each representation and in this case what this formula is telling me is that these vectors for irreducible representations in particular are orthogonal to each other not only that it's telling you that the length of the vector in the standard ordinary sense of the word length as we use it for inner products is actually going to be square root of mod g for each and every one of them so the vectors are not normalized but they are all normalized to the same value that is they are not normalized to unity but they are all normalized to square root of mod g if you think about it a bit this actually tells you that the number of irreducible representations a particular group can have is bounded simply because what we see here is that for each inequivalent irreducible representation you have a vector in that you have a vector for each representation but those vectors which stand for inequivalent irreducible representations are orthogonal to each other and that means that they are linearly independent now the dimensionality of the space which we are in is simply the number of components which each one of these vectors have and that is mod g the order of the group g so this clearly shows us that we cannot have more such vectors than the order of the group simply because you cannot have more linearly independent vectors in a vector space than the dimensionality of the space so the first bound that we have on the number of irreducible representations of a particular group of course I, when i say number of irreducible representations i mean the number of inequivalent irreducible representations the upper bound that we have found now for that number is the order of the group as we will soon see the actual number of irreps is usually lower in addition to this let me clear up one point we have derived this particular relationship for orthogonality between character vectors by starting for the special form which the great orthogonality theorem takes specifically for unitary representations however the final result is not restricted only to unitary representations all we need to see that is the result that we have already proven that for a finite group or in fact for a compact group every representation is equivalent to a corresponding unitary representation since the character which is the trace of a matrix does not change under a similarity transformation the characters for any representation is the same as the characters for the equivalent unitary representation hence this relationship that we have derived which involves only the characters will be valid no matter whether the representation that you are using is unitary or not let us now explore this concept of the character of a representation in a bit more detail so as i have said already given a representation d which may or may not be irreducible the character is a map which assigns to every group element small g a number which is just a trace of d of g where d of course is a matrix which represents g now as you all know a standard property of a trace is that it is invariant under a similarity transformation we have already made use of this fact when we talked about this orthogonality of the character vector being independent of whether you are actually using a unitary representation or not but there's another reason why this invariance of the trace under similarity is very important in the context of characters remember that when two elements g and g prime are conjugate elements it means that there exists in the group capital g some element g bar such that g prime is g bar g g bar inverse now because d is a representation it respects group multiplication property 
that is d of g prime is d of g bar t of g d of g bar inverse and that implies that the matrices d of g and d of g prime are actually similar to each other and hence their corresponding traces the character of g and the character of g prime are going to be equal so not only is the character a function of the group element it actually is a function of the class which the group element belongs to so in other words it's a class function every element of a given conjugacy class corresponds to exactly the same character the other is what is of utmost importance here an immediate consequence of this is that in the orthogonality relation for character vectors we can replace the sum over all group elements by a sum over classes so basically what we can do is we can rewrite the orthogonality relation in this form instead of talking about chi alpha of g chi beta g star summed over all group elements we essentially go over classes c1 c2 c3 which the group has and we multiply chi alpha ci by chi beta ci star and sum up over all classes from i equals 1 to nc where nc is the total number of conjugacy classes in addition what we need is factor of small nci which counts exactly how many group elements are there in each class remember the actual sum is over the group elements the only reason why we can change it into a sum over classes is that every element in a given class contributes exactly the same amount so all you have to do is multiply the contribution of every element in a class by the number of elements in the class and then add up over all classes and that is how you change that sum over all g to this sum over all classes of course this keeps the right hand side mod g delta alpha beta completely unchanged now this actually has a very nice significance what we can do is we can represent the character not as a mod g dimensional vector with one component for every group element but with an nc dimensional vector with one component for every class and what we can also do in addition is that we can make the orthogonality relation between characters look even more like our ordinary inner product orthogonality rule by redefining the contribution from each class by adding an extra factor that is instead of saying the component corresponding to the class c1 is chi c1 we say it's root over n c1 by mod g times chi c1 similarly the contribution for the second class will be root over nc2 by mod g chi c2 and so on of course you must realize that we are choosing some kind of arbitrary ordering among the different classes uh, there is no natural ordering among classes really all we have to do is make a choice here but in any case when we choose an ordered basis for writing down a matrix representation or a column vector representation for a vector we actually make an arbitrary choice of order in the basis anyway this is very similar to that the only reason why we have included these ugly factors of square root of nci by mod g in the definition of the chi vector is that once you do that the orthogonality relation for the irreps simply become this chi alpha inner product with chi beta is delta alpha beta here dot stands for the hermite product or the inner product for complex vectors that we all know and love so in this particular form the connection between orthogonality of vectors and orthogonality of these characters become obvious here we do have a vector corresponding to the characters one element for every class and this is a genuine orthogonality relation between those vectors now an immediate consequence of this 
is that this gives us a tighter bound on the number of possible irreducible representations. Note that the character vector chi can be defined for any representation, but this orthogonality relation is valid only for irreducible representations. And what this actually says is that we have orthogonal and hence independent vectors, one for each irreducible representation. Now, the dimensionality of this space has now been reduced. You no longer need mod g numbers to describe these vectors. What you need is nc numbers to describe the vector, where nc, remember, is again the number of classes which the group has. So this gives us a bound on the number of irreducible representations. The number of irreducible representations, which is the equal here to the number of independent vectors you have in the space, must be less than or equal to the dimensionality of the space, which is nothing but the number of classes. So ultimately, we get this bound that the number of irreducible representations is less than or equal to the number of classes. As we will see later, this is actually an equality. The number of irreducible representations of any finite group is equal to the number of its conjugacy classes. Let us go back once again to our old friend, the group S3, or rather, the representations of the group S3. As we had already seen before, we had these three irreducible representations of the group S3. And now that we know that the number of irreducible representations is bounded by the number of classes, and we do know that S3 has three classes, it is obvious that these are the only three irreducible representations that S3 has, at least up to equivalences. Let us now take a look at what the character orthogonality relation will say about these irreducible representations. On your screen right now is one version of the character table for a group. What we have are the irreducible representations of the group labeling the rows and the columns are labeled by the group elements E, A, B, C, D and F. As you can realize, this is just the same table as the one you saw a while ago, except that each and every one of the matrices in that table has been replaced by the corresponding traces. Of course, the first two rows which corresponded to one dimensional representations will stay completely unchanged because the trace of a one by one matrix is nothing but the number that is there in the matrix itself. It's only the multidimensional representations, in this case the two dimensional representation number three, which is going to change substantially. There's one more point that you should be able to recognize very easily. The very first column, the column corresponding to the identity, will always have the numbers corresponding to the dimensionality of the representation. So just by looking at the first column, it is easy to see that the first two representations are one dimensional and the last one is two dimensional. Now that we have the characters depicted in the form of a nice table, we can make use of the character orthogonality relations. And for the time being, let's just check whether those relations are okay. Of course, once again, since we had only real matrices in this representation, all the characters are real, so the conjugation on chi beta g star is rather trivial. So what you are really going to do is multiply chi alpha by chi beta, just two numbers, of course two numbers for each group element, and add up over all the group elements. So let's just quickly verify the orthogonality relations here. For alpha and beta both pointing to representation 1, what we will simply get is 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 and so on, this is going to give you 6. By the way, this version of the character orthogonality relation is exactly the same as the one for the great orthogonality theorem itself that we talked about some time ago. Because once again, for one dimensional representations, characters and the numbers, the representations are one and the same. Very similarly, when alpha is taken to be 1, representation 1, and beta is taken to be representation 2, you get back the same result that we had worked out a while earlier. Now with alpha being representation 1 and beta being representation 3, it's slightly different. Earlier, of course, you had to worry about i, i prime, j, j prime values and you 
in particular for j and j prime that is for the second representation here representation number 3 you had several choices note that since characters are just numbers there is no such issue with additional matrix indices here you just multiply the characters and sum up and now you can easily see that if you multiply 1 by 2 and then 1 by 0, 1 by 0, 1 by 0, then 1 by 1, minus 1, 1 by minus 1, you end up with a total of 0 as you should. Since you are talking of two different representations, the delta alpha beta is going to be 0. Well, what about taking both the representations to be representation number 2? Again, something we have already seen before is going to give you 6. Pretty straight, straightforward. Representation number 2 and representation number 3 taken together will give you 1 times 2. The 3 middle terms, 3 terms corresponding to A, B, C will not give you anything because they are all 0 anyway. And the terms corresponding to D and F will give you 2 minus 1s and so you are going to get 0. And the final result that we have here, final orthogonality result from characters is that when alpha and beta are both taken to be number 3 and here you get 2 times 2 plus 3 zeros plus 2 minus 1 whole squares and that of course adds up to 6 as it should because once again when you take the same representation twice for both alpha and beta the result has to be the order of the group G. So the character orthogonality relations that we had derived can be seen to be verified here. This, however, is not the way in which a character table is usually represented for an obvious reason. As we had already said, character is a class function. So, different group elements belonging to the same conjugacy class will contribute exactly the same value to the character. And you can see that in the table in front of you. In fact, identity sits in a class of its own. Whereas A, B, C are in a single class, so in each of the representations A, B and C have the same character, D and F also are in a conjugacy class and so D and F also has exactly the same character. What that means is instead of labeling the columns by using the group elements themselves, it will be more economical to label them using the class labels. So let us divide up the group into its three conjugacy classes. The order I have chosen here is slightly arbitrary. C1 is almost invariably ch chosen by everybody to be the one class containing the identity and the identity alone. The rest of the ordering is somewhat arbitrary. So what we have is three classes, C1 with one element, C2 with three elements and C3 with two elements. The number of elements is something you have to keep track of simply because when you are going to use the orthogonality relation using this version of the character table which labels the columns with just classes you have to remember to weight each contribution by the number of elements in that class so when we write it down we not only note down the labels for the classes we also typically note down the number of elements in the class which are the numbers in red one three and two in this table of course this table is a much more compact version of the table that we had before the only thing you have to do is you have to exercise a bit of care when you are using it. Simply because when you are going to multiply something like the vector chi2 with the vector chi3 as an example, what you have to do is multiply 1 by 2, of course the characters themselves. But not only that, you have to weight it by the number of elements in that particular class. So since C1 has only one element, it's 1 times 1 times 2. Since C2 has three elements, you have to multiply 3 by minus 1 by 0. Minus 1 and 0 being the individual characters. C3 will contribute 2, the number of elements in C3, times 1, the character of representation 2 for C3, times minus 1, the contribution from representation number 3. And when you add them all together, you of course get 0 as you should. This of course is the same result as the one we had before, is just being written in a slightly different manner. Let me point out that as an alternative, we could have also tabulated the components of the normalized character vectors that we talked about a while ago. That is, each and every one of these elements in the table 
could have been multiplied by square root of the number of elements in a class divided by the order of the group in order to get normalized vectors so that we could just calculate a dot product or the inner product just like we calculate dot products of ordinary vectors. Now if you did that, the character table on the left would now look like the character table on the right. Of course, now that we have already taken into account the number of elements in the normalizing factor, I no longer need to keep track of how many elements are there in each class. As you can easily check, each and every one of these vectors are orthogonal and normalized in their own right in the standard inner product of vectors. And just to illustrate that, let me just show you that if you were to take a dot product between the character vector corresponding to representation number 2 and that corresponding to representation number 3, you would get 1 by root 6 times 2 by root 6 plus minus 1 by root 2 times 0 plus 1 by root 3 times minus 1 by root 3. And when you add them all together and cancel out the factors, you will see that the result is 0, as it should be. Of course, you should not expect a new result this way. It's the same result written in a different fashion. Given the fact that the character table in this version of normalized vectors look a lot more formidable than the previous one, it is the previous one that we use in most cases. The only thing that you have to remember when you are using that is when you are taking the inner product between two vectors in the character table as the one on the left, you will have to weight each contribution by the number of elements in each class. But that is pretty easy to keep track of. And so I'm pretty sure everybody will prefer the character table version on the left. We will spend a lot of time with character tables in the lectures to come. And I'm pretty sure you will all prefer the version on the left rather than the version on the right. The reason why character tables will be ubiquitous in coming classes is that many of the very important questions that we ask about group representations can be answered entirely in terms of characters. Questions like, is a particular representation of a group reducible? If it is, what irreducible representations do it reduce to? How many times does a particular irreducible representation occur in a reducible representation? The answer to all these questions can be found out in terms of properties of the characters. And in calculations involving these questions, the character table is going to play a huge role. We will explore some of these questions in the next lecture. Until then, bye for now.